So we're going to ask our speakers to go ahead and stand over here in the middle. Group photo. Group photo. I have a whole bunch of questions. I'll, I'll like I'll divide them with you, and we'll just go back and forth. We're going to say ladies first. So go ahead, Joe. Okay, or I'll go first. All right, so the first question is MCT oils, leaky gut. Coconut oil is considered in this category. Is it causing leaky gut? Does heat break down the structure? Not, and because I guess it's not seeming to work as it is supposed to. Does anybody have any, any, uh, any extra things they'd like to say about coconut oil and leaky gut? So I can answer some stuff about MCT oil. Um, Dave alluded to this earlier. I did an experiment where I was eating keto chow with different types of fat. I didn't go into it in my presentation. But the short of it is when I introduced a tablespoon of MCT oil instead of a tablespoon of, this, of avocado oil, my triglycerides doubled and my HDL got cut in half. Both of those are considered bad things. I no longer use MCT oil. My daughter, who has depression, on the other hand, does. Because I, my, my take on MCT oil is if you have some sort of a neurological condition that needs higher ketones, like really needs higher ketones, MCT is a beautiful thing and far more effective than any ketone supplement. That said, what it also does is make you go to the bathroom a lot. Um, so in that regard, it does that really well. Um, but yeah, be careful with it. And again, I don't use it because my, my aim is not to treat a neurological condition. But as far as heat treatment, I don't have any information about that. Um, long chain fats that are fully saturated are very stable. And MCT is one of those. So is coconut oil in general. Okay. You go ahead and ask a question, but we'll try to stay flush with the wall because I can see there's people over there. Okay. We don't want to okay. So I'm going to assume this one is for Dave or it could have been for Dr. Boz. But if my triglycerides are lower than my HDL, what is the next most important number that I should be concerned about? Well, first of all, of course, that alludes a little bit to a ratio. Um, fun fact to know until I actually don't love ratios. I like just more cut points. So per, I prefer HDL myself for myself and my family to be 50 and above triglycerides to be 100 and below. So because if you have a ratio, like, for example, I know people who have, say, an HDL of 140, so they could have triglycerides of 140. Or conversely, I do know some folks who have, like, say, triglycerides at 40, but HDL of 40. I don't know that that's that great. So as far as that, I think that that's pretty relevant. Beyond that, um, I thought Dr. Boz had an amazing list. Smoking, if you didn't already knock that one out, get rid of that right away. But also C-reactive protein is such a fantastic marker because it is a nonspecific inflammatory remarker, uh, uh, marker, not remarker, um, in, that, <laughs> in that it's extremely sensitive you won't get a diagnosis from it, but you'll, you will be able to start to isolate down at least one of two major categories. Either your body knows about it and feels it's needing to respond systemically with an, infl an inflammatory response, which is uh, what my talk was about, or it isn't. Either it does need inflammation, it doesn't know about it, or it's some other category of what it is. A lot of the stories that I was hearing um, posed back to Ken Berry that was one of the first things I was thinking is I was like, I wonder what that person's labs would say, at least with inflammation, because that's already the, the beginning of the fork in which direction to go. But if, you're, if your C-reactive protein is elevated, that's something to look into a bit further to find out if it's chronically inflamed. Because if it's a chronic inflammation, it could be something that you may want to better find out what's going on under the hood. We have a question for Coach well, Mary. Can I, can I add to that? Oh, sure, absolutely. Is Sorry. that all right? Am I allowed? No. Yeah. No. Uh, I just want to add to no. <laughs> I just want to add to that that there's other things to look at too. So the most important thing that you should be focused on is the thing that you think is going to make the most impact right now. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be what's the next number that my doctor says this or this book said that or this influencer said is important. What if the number one thing you could work on right now is increasing lean mass? 
increasing skeletal muscle mass percentage, increasing VO2 max, or doing or in, decreasing your resting heart rate, getting sleep, getting more sleep. There's there's always something. It's not always a marker that we're looking to change. It's there's other things to look at too. So don't look it, keep those blinders on and just look at the blood markers as as your progress. So for Coach Mary, how do you fight cravings brought on by instant stress? For example, a bad phone call or a, an immediate problem at work. So those are both of those are danger zones that I talked about earlier. It's something that can cause you to choose food um, to to cope, and so. I, I just, you got to listen for the lie that's associated with that. And usually the lie is, well, I'm stressed. So obviously food or not food, cookies, sweets, it's going to make it better. Or maybe, you know, there are people who use, they, they are eating the right things, but they're overeating real food. Um, and so you just have to look to see, you know, you ask yourself, like, what's my real need here? It's not the food. It's not hunger. And what you're wanting, you're wanting relief. So, you know, I would encourage you to make a list of things that have nothing to do with food that bring you relief, pleasure, joy, and pick something, you know, have that list handy and pick something from that list to use to soothe yourself uh, other than food. You got to find your real need. Okay. Here's one in Bronson. and I promise I did not write this one. It says, Coach, what types of movement are best for those of us who have issues like arthritis and scoliosis, people who cannot be guided by an, an in-person trainer? Yeah. Maybe they can't afford a personal coach. So if you're – wow, if you don't have someone that can be there with you walking yeah. through stuff. So what are some things we the, can do the, like that? The movements don't – it, it, the seven essential movements, the things we all need to do, squatting, hinging, pushing, pulling, all those types of things, carrying things, those don't change. What changes is how you do them. We talked about this in the workshop right before lunch. If you have it to make a modification or change a movement because of a limitation that you have, the easiest thing to do is limit that range of motion. If you have something wrong with your hip and you can't squat all the way down, find a level that you can squat to. If you can't move your, put your hand all the way over the head, then whatever that range of motion limitation is, that's what you're working with. So the, the question isn't what can't I do or what is limiting me? The question is what can I do? So if you're focusing on what things you can perform and how well can you perform them and work within that bubble, then things are, will progress from there. Does that make sense? Say again. Like Joe's legs work. Like Joe's leg, like right. You got the, the thing with your with your foot and your ankle. So well, that's a good example. I mean, I'll, uh, so we were hanging out in Kentucky, and I said, if you had, if anybody ever looks at me, you'll notice I walk with a limp, and one calf is three times the size of the other. It's because I spent thirty years limping from being on arthritis because I have a shattered ankle. I said to Bronson, "What can I do to build up the muscle?" He's like, "Well, here's what we can do: sit on your rower and only use one leg, and then that will build up the other leg, and we do the best we can, and it's helped." I did the left leg has gotten stronger. So. Question for Dave Feldman. Is it a good sign if a keto diet lowered LDL and raised HDL initially? Um, so, of course, I'm, I'm going to be cautious. I, I'm going to give a very unsatisfying answer in that there's just not enough information. <laughs> That's part of the problem is this is part of why we're trying to get the data in the first place. Lipids are great, but if you've watched any of my experiments or my talks where I'm quite literally changing my lipids, not just over the course of days, but often over hours when I go so far as to track them at those levels. So without getting greater specificity, without getting a longer sense of the timelines involved, it's hard to even give a speculative answer on what I think might be the case. But if you've got health improvements, I will say this much, which is that as much as I love lipids, uh, I think that a lot of the health gains that have other cardiovascular benefits in association should be looked after more. It's one of the most amazing things I think of this era right now that I personally know lots of people who have improved their blood pressure, have managed to get off lots of medication, and they're looking at something that I'm not even going to say what the name of it is, but has a much lower hazard ratio association comparatively to the things I just now mentioned. Like if you lose a lot of weight, 
that already says a lot if you can regain that amount of metabolism. So anyway, I, I hope that gave a little bit of an answer, but still somewhat unsatisfying. And I will say that since we're here on the cruise, I, I mean, as you can tell, Dave seems like the most approachable person ever, right? Obviously. I mean, actually, your voice sounds like a hug. I, I've never destroyed, like, dis described a, a voice like that, but it, it, it feels like a hug when you talk. So if you have um, this question, maybe this was your question, this is anonymous, if this was your question, you can approach him and, and get more specific into it. He'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you. Okay, you can give the microphone to Chris. I, I love this one. This I'd love to have Dr. Barry answer this one, but it would be too blunt and scare a lot of people off. It says, Chris. I won't even swear. I have been spending a lot of money on supplements. Do I need to take supplements while I'm on keto and carnivore? I don't understand how just eating meat, I'm going to get all of the vitamins and minerals that I need. If I need to take supplements, which one should I take? Eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, it's everything you need to make a chicken. If you want, I, I, meat is amazing. Eggs, I kind of think, are a little bit better if you can tolerate them. Uh, ground beef is fantastic. Uh, smoke some stuff. Learn how to use a sous vide. Uh, all, by the way, all cooking devices are medical devices. They, you cannot write them off on an FSA Unless or you have a YouTube a channel. Account. What was that? Unless oh, you have a YouTube channel. Start a, so YouTube, start a YouTube, channel. YouTube channel. Yes. Start a YouTube channel. Write it off that way. That's the best way to do it. But reclaim your health by cooking meat. Um, that's by far the best way to go. I mean, I created Keto Chow because I'm so lazy. I wanted to not have to take supplements and all that other stuff. Um, the best supplements to take are probably electrolytes. But as far as vitamins go... You really can get all of that from meat. And I will add to yeah. this. We wrote a thing for one of our um, for, for one of our courses for beef our beef, beef butter bacon egg course. I should probably write it into a vlog, but you can get more vitamins and nutrients from eating ruminant animals, liver, and salmon roe than you can from all of the superfoods of spinach and all of those other vegetables that they say you will get 10 times more nutrients from ruminant animals liver and salmon roe and it was wonderful to, and your yeah, body will use it exactly i was thinking about chris but it's like can i actually use it is it actually bioavailable so this next question is for coach mary if you love a food that you know you will overeat do you never consume it allow it on your birthdays allow it on holidays. What's your opinion? Uh, there's lots of foods I love that don't love me back. Therefore, they're considered drug foods and I never eat them. Okay. <laughs> Can I actually add to that? A lot, a lot of people assume because I do a lot of very controlled experiments that I must therefore be very controlled with my diet in my life. It's just straight up not true. There are are lots of times in which I'll cheat, but my version of cheats is that I change what the parameters of the cheat is. For example, I'm allowing for myself to have more Sprite Zeros and Coke Zeros when I try not to drink as much diet, you know, drinks at home. But that's within parameters that aren't going to spin out of control. To your point, I have some foods that are even considered keto. I will overeat them if they're in the house. Mm -hmm. So I just don't have them in the house and I don't eat them at all. And that's the only way I can treat it. I have to treat it as something that's basically a controlled substance because if I have that slice of pizza, I won't have one slice of pizza. That slice of pizza represents 1,500 boxes of pizza if I eat that one slice. So that's how I think of it, and that's the only way it works for me. And I'll add, for those people who, aren't do, who, who are shopping for a family, you're not the only one in the house, don't use your family as an excuse. Yep. I'm getting it for my husband. I'm getting it for my kids. I'm getting it for my spouse, yep. right? If it's not in the house, it's not in the house. It doesn't matter who it's for. So when I began my journey of recovery, there were other people living in my house, and I would open my pantry, and there was never less than six boxes of cereal in there, all the processed junk foods. And so one of the things I did to... Uh, retrain my brain I guess if I opened the pantry and I saw that I would stop and say out loud that belongs to Brett Nolan and Bradley that is not your food Mary and I would just repeat that like over and over that does not belong to me so I don't eat it have you been reading atomic habits <laughs> 
So this one is kind of related for Mary, but I think everybody should answer this one. It says, I have read that one cheat day a week can be good for you and possibly help to break plateaus. What is your opinion on this? I think everybody should answer this one, although it was directed to Mary. Rachel, you got the microphone up there? I do. We'll start with Mary. Um, I'm going to like channel Dr. Barry. That's BS. Like, Bronson is just like... <laughs> you know, like one, <clears throat> if, you are, if you have a history of not being able to moderate... And every time you attempt to moderate, it goes downhill, whether it's that same day, the next day, next week, or next month. Um, you know, having a, a cheat is not going to be beneficial. And like I said in my talk earlier today, a cheat implies it's going to advance you in some way. You know, you cheat on a test or something, like you're winning, right? But when you are cheating on your food sobriety and a cheat means high blood pressure, inflammation, cravings, bloat, stomach ache, headache, there's no advancement there. So I totally disagree with that. I think cheating is unnecessary. It's the beginning of a relapse. Actually, relapse starts in your brain. When you start, it's when you start thinking about it, that's the start of the relapse. By the time you put it in your mouth, you've already been relapsing. Hey, Rachel, do you have your phone over there? Can you note in podcasts like cheating does not advance you? I like that. That's good. Well, I think the important thing is this is what Mary's talking about is for us that are addicts. Yeah. For people who aren't addicts, they, they, well, you know, they exist, right? Right. I don't know any of them, but um, <laughs> they may be able to do that. But uh, no, I can't do that personally. I don't even think it's about being addicts as much as it is impossible to live a new life if you keep practicing the things from life. The term cheat implies there was an original commitment. So either you take that commitment seriously or you don't take it seriously. When you're saying cheat, it's sort of your way of acknowledging that you're breaking a rule that you considered important. And now you're trying to create a subset of a rule that you think is gonna make it easier. But I'm just gonna speak plainly. I have a family full of folks who've struggled with various diets, and it goes very extended, and I know of no person, at least within my own circle of friends, who had some version of a cheat day that is on whatever diet they were doing past six months or a year. So I now just say that to them up front. I say, by the way, I, there's a 100% record of folks I know who try to have a cheat day for where they do not succeed at whatever diet that they're currently on. Instead, find the diet that works for you, that you can stick to, that you know you can stick to, and just don't have any cheating. That, that's, that's my advice. That's actually awesome. I mean, there, it, it, within our commitment of our marriage, Joe, you have absolutely no cheat days allowed. I'm just going to say that publicly. I don't think that would help our marriage in any way. No. I, I, just, I, I just don't see it. So, um, question for Dave Feldman. Are you getting, or do you anticipate, resistance from the ph pharmaceutical industry? Actually, it's, I will say this. It is, it is ironic because I am actively working with research partners who themselves work with research dollars and projects that are in pharma. Now, I will tell you, for the most part, they're not looking in our direction because there's not really a lot of folks, um, particularly in the lean mass hypersmoder community, that are as heavily targeted. I, I don't even know if I want to say the word targeted. Or as heavily part of a demographic that they would be pursuing, right? But I will say that that's been something I've kind of appreciated because I do think if the data show what I'm hoping it'll show, the conversation will definitely start getting started there. But I, again, I tried to do my best not to uh, overpromise what it is that we can you know, make available or whether or not anybody should use what data we're going to show to decide for their own care with their doctor. They should always work with their doctor. I'm gonna continue saying that. So pharma should be happy that I'm very aware of those processes but as far as whether high ldl is going to be bad regardless of all excellent metabolic health otherwise 
That, I think, is data we owe those same folks I was talking about earlier, the people with epilepsy, severe type 1 diabetes, et cetera. They should at least know whether medication to lower their LDL is required for their specific circumstance. And I think that's something I would hope everybody would be on board with. Sometimes I look at Dave Feldman and I think, this is Clark Kent, and any minute he's just going to be <laughs> Superman, right? Cholesterol man. I love it. Okay, next one. Okay. What does rest mean? Uh, does it mean do, n do other than normal life in a day or two? Um, or can I just still work out and tone down a little bit? Yeah. So rest, if we want to define rest, then we're going to define it as any activity or lack of activity that doesn't create a stimulus in your body, that your body doesn't have to respond to. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to go walk 10 miles on my rest day. If you have to recover after the, after the activity, then it's not recovery. You can't recover from recovery. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you, what, your rest day should be something that you can come back from with more energy, feeling better, ready to do more work, not, oh my God, I just walked 10 miles on my rest day, now I gotta do legs tomorrow. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what we're looking for. That's pretty much it, it's pretty simple. Can a carnivore diet prevent getting a sunburn? Are sunscreens and suntan lotions necessary? I'm 54 years old, been a carnivore for 14 months. Last year, moved to Arizona. Um, it, it, and this is the first summer that I'm not getting a sunburn. It, it, no sunscreen used. I haven't used sunscreen in five years. Me neither. I don't know about you guys. I'm as pasty white as Jim Gaffigan. I have to use sunscreen. <laughs> No matter what. You're also from Utah. Yes. <laughs> I don't use any sunscreen. You said two years? Yeah, two years ago, and I stopped wearing sunglasses. Actually, I'll add, by the way, I walk about 45 minutes to an hour in the Las Vegas sun most days. So, and I'm how I look right now. So, that helps. I will tell you that Rachel, when I married her, was Casper the Friendly Ghost. Yes. More and like would burn like to beat red. She stopped using sunscreen like three years ago. And you can look at her. She'll go out in the sun for a couple of hours. And even if she turns red the next day, she's tan. An amazing we do look. have a thing on our, on our, if you really want to wear some kind of sunblock, though, we have a thing on our channel with just zinc oxide and some yeah. tallow and like not all the chemicals that are in the garbage that they're selling us in a store. Yeah. Um, Okay, some of these uh, some of these questions I'm gonna put into the Dr. Barry and Dr. Boz pile because they're really good medical questions, and I think they would. Uh, some of them are about Alzheimer's and stuff. But here's one for Dave: Can you discuss how I can get into research studies? How do you become a citizen scientist? You are a citizen scientist. <laughs> Start there, right? So this is, by the way, and and I wanted to say this also. Uh, when people were directing questions to um, Ken Berry. I, I, right now, uh, did you guys know that I take pictures of literally every single thing I ingest? Every single thing. That used to be how I'd start a lot of my talks, and now so many people gotten used to it. But I still do it. Chris was there in the beginning, right? This has been about eight years running now. Right? hundred bucks if you catch him eating something you didn't take a picture of. It's true. <laughs> I have everything I consume today on my phone right now. You want to know why? Because even though I thought at some point I was going to stop, I realized, no, actually, this is very, very, very easy. We're blessed to be in a technological age where I can quite literally log everything I consume. And that is data. That is extremely useful data. Now, it used to be that I'd put everything in chronometer. But now, I put everything in my phone, so if I need to, I can backtrack <coughs> and then look back if all of a sudden I had some odd gas pains, if all of a sudden I had unusual fatigue and I wasn't sure if I was having enough of my electrolytes. That was easy enough for me to do. So getting back to being a citizen scientist, let me tell you, if you have your own issues that you're working with, get used to the fact that your data talks to you. We like to think we're aware of everything we're eating, everything we're doing, everywhere we're at. But that's one of the first things that I was teaching myself about being a citizen scientist, was that the more that I recorded, the more I could find out what I could do differently that would improve my health. And that's, that's what I think is one of the first steps to then sort of understanding where you can go from there. Now, 
If you want to get involved with, for example, CitizenScienceFoundation.org, if you want to help us to recruit people for not just the study that we're uh, hopefully going to be completing soon, but we may have some companion studies coming out, well then keep an eye on that website. But also, if you can, try to help others and share your data. Just generally speaking, we uh, if you think of the low-carb movement in general, how many world-class doctors started prescribing to their patients to go on a low-carb, high-fat diet 10 years ago? How many? Do, do you guys know any? One. One. Yes. Dr. Barry. <laughs> Dr. Barry. Eric Westman, right? Of course, yep. Atkins was the OG, right? <coughs> but low carb is in fact a citizen science movement i only found out about it because i was going on the forums there was uh, diabetes.co.uk how many people have visited diabetes.co.uk yeah so and they were talking then about lchf low carb high fat and at that point i was like wow you know actually a lot of what's being said here makes a little bit more sense than a lot of these institutional sites i think i'm going to try this and that's what i did so to me i was indoctrinated into citizen science before i even had a name for it and that's what I think everybody can do for not only themselves, but hopefully for others um, who, whose health they touch, because that's been so meaningful to me with my family. You have another one? I do. I have two more for Dave. The first one is, will monogenetic FH show up in the DNA test like 23andMe and Ancestry.com? Um, and if so, can citizen scientists link their DNA results to your study? Uh, yes, I believe 23andMe not only has monogenetic FH, it has a number of other that are on the um, FH spectrum, I guess you could say. Um, Ancestry.com, I don't know, actually, on that one. Um, we, we cannot do study currently on monogenetic FH with Lundquist on our current uh, study, and of course, I, I doubt it would um, pass through IRB approval. Um, but Yes, if, if there are people who do have monogenetic FH, they're getting their own data and they would like to submit it for possible case studies. Um, that's always a possibility, but of course, I would naturally uh, disclaim that this is, you know, conventional medical science would say that there's a risk if they're allowing for their LDL to be high. Um, my talk actually goes into why it is that um, higher levels of LDL might actually be problematic if you've got monogenetic FH, specifically uh, homozygous monogenetic FH. So, okay, uh, we have two more questions. The first I have one. one. Oh, you have one. Go ahead. Yep. This one's going to be for Bronson. Why am I gaining weight on carnivore? There are so many things. We don't have enough time. <laughs> I'm just asking the question. Um, possibly because you're not looking at what the weight's made of. Maybe you're gaining muscle. Maybe it's water. Maybe uh, there's a number of things. Uh, many people, if they start eating enough food, which a lot of people haven't been doing, once you start eating more food, your body starts replacing and building that muscle mass that you have been lacking for years. So gaining weight isn't always necessarily a bad thing. A lot of times weight gain can be a sign of healing, which is why I tell people to stop worrying about how much you weigh. Yep. What is that weight made of? Do I have, what's my lean mass? What's my muscle mass? Am I able to do more? What are, the, in, what are the, the measures of my quality of life and how are those improving? Because the weight can't tell you that, right? Shirt size matter? No. Not, right? Yeah, now you're not having a bigger life. You, you can have a small shirt and, and you got that? Uh, the size of your shirt doesn't determine the size of your life. Okay, so what are you able to do? What is your physical ability? How are you moving? How's your day? How's your pain? How's your, all the different things that you've been complaining about for years. How are those things doing? Your weight can't tell you anything of that. And Jill, but. What degree, uh, Dave Feldman, of, of NACLEAN learning are you using for your study? NACLEAN? What degree of? I can't quite read the word. I can't read it either. What degree of NACLEAN? Machine. Oh, machine learning. Oh, okay. All right. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can't actually answer that just yet because there's – Lundquist has their own statistician. We have one that's part of our team, the very talented uh, Adrian Sotomoda. Um, and so to what degree we can make use of it, I'm very interested. But what I like about machine learning is if done right, it should be very objective. 
I love all versions of automating thought processes because that usually tends to be more scientific. You don't want the inputs to be what biases your outputs. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not quite yet determined. Oh, can I add real quick onto the other thing? For anybody doing carnivore, my lowest hanging fruit, if you're having problems with it, especially with weight gain, is cut out liquid and refined forms of fat. So it's a, the, the, the form of the processing, just again, like with keto, there's now a lot of labels getting slapped onto things. But in reality, if you find you're over consuming or you think it's possible you're over consuming, the form in which you're consuming it may actually be relevant. So I myself cannot overeat, say, hard boiled eggs and, and steak, like, like try doing that. I, I can't do it. So yeah. just my thought. Yeah, well, it, it's not just that. It's also the GI tract. You learn how the GI tract has a lot of signaling cascades, especially with the hind, uh, uh, hind gut and GLP-1. Things along those lines are having a big signaling cascade. Our final question, since we are about to dismiss and go to dinner, and just a reminder, it's formal night tonight. So, okay, don't put your swim trunks on, all right? Put something over, ball gown nights tonight. But as a question, what is currently your favorite go-to dinner? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and go with a burger. Sorry, I know it's probably not what everyone else is choosing, but I just love a nice, juicy, thick burger with cheese on it. Yeah, ground beef and eggs. So, because we like to involve our children with food, we have do ah, taco guts a lot. Which is ground beef with all the stuff to make tacos, but thrown in a bowl. Nice. It's delicious. <laughs> Am I de I, it's very boring. Um, ribeye, usually. Rachel, I'm just going to say like three to one, like ground beef to ribeye there. I, so I'm, like, I mean, you know, four <laughs> out of one. What is it? Nine out of ten doctors. <laughs> 